Caution step one. Repeat your message in as many ways as possible, as many times as possible, while still avoiding detection. Why do you think you hear the same commercial over and over again? It's not because they're trying to make sure everyone hears it, it's because they know that you need to hear the message repeatedly until it gets into your head. But you can't just go read the word God and think you know what's going on. Can't do it. You got to look up the definitions, and that's what the Lord told me to do for y'all. Brainwashing step two. Include subliminal messages in as many places as possible. Brainwashing step three. Condition your victim to associate your message with primitive things like sex. Can you please not put that in there? Piss off now. <laughs> Piss off. Hell yeah, I'm a fallen angel. We're all fallen angels. The devil always thinks on himself. <laughs> yeah. The bottom line is you should be in control of your life. The locus of control should be inside of you and not with some other person or group or ideology. Mind control groups have a black and white, us versus them, good versus evil, very simplistic. So you're either on the inside and you have the truth and if you're out on the outside and you're the devil or there's something wrong with you. If a group says don't read this book or don't talk to this person because they're an ex-member or a critic, Go and talk to them right away and make up your own mind whether the, what they say is real. And the tricky thing with religious organizations is they frame it as you have to obey God, but you're in a human institution who, who, whose leaders say that they represent God and they know what God wants, and that's the question mark. We've noticed a particular trend in deliverance ministry and online theological talk about fallen supernatural beings broadly. There's an inordinate, erroneous, and even in some cases sinister emphasis taking shape on the idea that divine rebels, fallen watchers, fallen sons of God, can be redeemed. Believe it or not, this sort of talk emerges from survivor programming. And the reason is simple, but it's, it's pretty profound too. Fallen divine beings want redemption because they want to be restored to their natural place too, just like fallen humans do. But they have been rejected all the way back to the original rebel, to the inhabitants of the abyss, Genesis 6, to the rejected gods of the nations whose final demise will be at the day of the Lord. Isaiah 34, we've talked about this a lot in the podcast. Fallen divine beings want redemption because they want to be restored to their natural place, too. Just like fallen humans do. But they have been rejected. All the way back to the original rebel, to the inhabitants of the abyss, Genesis 6, to the rejected gods of the nations, whose final demise will be at the day of the Lord. Isaiah 34, we've talked about this a lot in the podcast. Fern, Audrey, and Beth believe that this circumstance explains the nature of the deception they see enslaving survivors on a regular basis. If intelligent evil, let's put it this way, if intelligent evil can't be rejoined to the family, if they can't join the family of the redeemed, then they will deceive the redeemed into thinking they are rejected as well. The game plan is to blind the victim to the truth that they were created to be God's imagers, part of his family, participants with him in his plan of restoring Eden, of belonging to God's own family and inner circle, and blind them to all that and blind them to, to, the, to the task. And the task is reflecting God's love to the lost and using their giftedness to accomplish this mission. But this is from a different interview of Wright about his, uh, his book on the atonement. And he says, humans are called not just to keep certain moral standards in the present and to enjoy God's presence here and hereafter, but to celebrate, worship, procreate, and take responsibility within the rich, vivid, developing life of creation. According to Genesis, that is what humans were made for. The diagnosis of the human plight is then not simply 
that humans have broken God's moral law, offending and insulting the Creator whose image they bear, though that is true as well, this law-breaking is a symptom of a much more serious disease. Morality is important, but it isn't the whole story. Called to responsibility and authority within and over the creation, humans have turned their vocation upside down, giving worship and allegiance to forces and powers within creation itself. The name for this is idolatry. The result is slavery and finally death. It isn't just that humans do wrong things and so incur punishment. This is one element of the larger problem, which isn't so much about a punishment that might seem almost arbitrary, perhaps even draconian. It is rather about direct consequences. When we worship and serve forces within the creation, the creation for which we're supposed to be responsible, we hand over our power to other forces only too happy to usurp our position. We humans have thus, by abrogating our own vocation, handed our power and authority to non-divine and non-human forces, I mean both of them, which have then run rampant, spoiling human lives, ravaging the beautiful creation, and doing their best to turn God to turn God's word into a hell. And and again, if, if you think about this in the in the framework of imaging, what does it mean to be God's imager? It means you're part of the family. You belong there by definition. It's it's a birthright. It's not something earned or merited by either works to get saved or or doing spectacular spiritual power things so that God is sort of convinced that you belong here. Okay, it is none of that. This is a birthright and it's broken, you know, by the fall and we we have to be redeemed. But it, it's it's being part of the family. And then since you are part of the family, you participate in the mission. And after the fall, part of that mission, a big part of that mission, is taking the truth of the cross and the resurrection to the lost. And you know, in Paul's context, you know, the, the Gentile thing, that involves reiterating, continually making the point that because of the resurrection, you know, for the for the Gentile especially. The gods that were installed over you, who became corrupt, you now need to abandon them. They are powerless. They have been stripped of authority. They have been fired. Okay. Come back home and participate with God to get more of that task done. But when we, when we you know, like, like Wright says, you know, when you start handing that responsibility or, or redefining it or, or, or changing it into an allegiance, a partnership with an intelligent evil, you've become an idolater. Chapter 21 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The devil always thinks on himself. <laughs> yeah! The Lord, 
Men depart from evil. Now listen. You listen today good. You listen sharp today. The Bible says, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, the Bible said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Think about that. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Psalm says, and Romans 3 repeats it, that there is, in talking about the condition of a lost man, that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Let me tell you why you're not saved here today. If you're not saved, that's because you don't have an old-time Holy Ghost Bible fear of God. If you knew for one second what it would mean for you to stand before the judgment bar of Almighty God without Christ, you would run down here in front of this church and get saved and say, Stop your preaching! I've got to get saved. The fear, of, the fear of the Lord, men turn from their sins. Most people that I've seen saved down through the years were not saved because they uh, felt God's love. I'm sorry to say that. Very seldom does a man get saved just because he's told that Jesus loves him or that Jesus died for him. A man never sees his need for Christ until he knows that he's doomed and damned and condemned and guilty before God. Most people I've seen saved were, were saved because they knew that they had broken God's holy law and they were in trouble. And that they needed a Savior and that there was no other way than Jesus Christ's substitutionary death for their sin. The Bible says repeatedly this theme, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come. That means run and run fast. Get away from your danger. This crowd that doesn't want hellfire and brimstone preached is a bunch of mockers and scoffers. There is no human fix for the condition that we're in except divine intervention. Divine intervention from heaven above is the only fix for a man's lost soul. I'm telling you, listen, psychology and, and, and philosophy and all the religion and all the garbage that has spewed out of hell for the last 6,000 years can never save a man's soul. Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that can save your soul this morning. Only thing that can deliver you from wrath. The subject of hell and the lake of fire is unpopular with, first of all, the lost. And I can understand that when I was lost and would walk into a church house and a preacher started talking about hell, I began to get scoffy and mocky and say, is that all he can ever think about? And I didn't want to hear it and I tried to shove it out of my mind. But you listen to this preacher this morning. I'm not preaching Reggie Kelly's ideas. They ain't worth a flip. But I'm telling you this Bible teaches that every person in this building this morning in less than a hundred years is going to be either in heaven or in hell depending on what you did with Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't say it would be a good idea for you to be born again. He said you must be born again. You've got to repent of your sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or you will perish in the bowels of hell. You pro Listen to me. You'll remember this Sunday. I promise you, if you're lost in this church house, you're going to remember this Sunday. Forever and forever, you're going to remember this message. If you die and go to hell, I promise you that day after day and night after night, you remember that God the Holy Ghost Send a preacher to you and send his word to you and send his spirit to you to warn you to flee from the wrath to come. The subject of hell and lake of fire is unpopular with preachers even. I'm so sick of our preachers in America, I can't hardly stand it. I mean, my heart is grieved. I, I mean, my stomach churns. When's the last time you heard it, uh, uh, Dr. Dobson or anybody else on, on radio preach about hell? When's the last time you heard your favorite radio preacher or TV preacher preach about hell and the lake of fire? And warn people that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven. And that they must flee to Him in order to escape the wrath of God. You don't hear the wrath of God. You don't hear the lake of fire. You don't hear hell preached on anymore in our messages across this country. Most church con congregations will run a preacher off if he preaches they think too much on the subject of hell. Give us some things. Give us smooth things. Preach smooth things to us. Don't make us think about those things. The religious crowd hates the preaching of hell. The educated crowd denies hell. The seminaries do not teach on hell. The devil himself doesn't hardly, I mean, does not like preaching on hell. Putting the thought of hell out of your mind does not negate the reality and the importance and the fact of it. You can live in denial for 90 years. I've known people see me like they live in, uh, for 90 years and deny, and deny the fact that uh, they're a heartbeat away from an eternal hell. But that does not destroy it. John chapter 5 verse 28 and 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. Think about that. Think about that. Now, just in case you're one of these soul sleepers, 
And you believe that you just go to the grave when you die. God said that all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. And they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of the just and life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is a resurrection. The fact of resurrection assures us that there's life after death. Just because you leave this physical body does not mean that you cease to exist. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And as is it appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. In other words, there's things that's going to happen to you, friend, after you die. You don't cease to exist just because you leave this body. Each one of us will forever and forever dwell and exist in eternity somewhere. The question is not, is there life after death? For we know that there is. The question is not, does one continue conscious existence? For we know that we do. The question is, where will you be in eternity? Why did Jesus Christ come down from heaven? Why did Jesus Christ take upon Himself the form of a man? Why did Jesus Christ suffer and die on the cross of Calvary? Why did He let Him spit in His face? Why did He let Him pluck His beard? Why did He bear the wrath of God upon His own soul? Why did He pour out His soul unto death? I'm telling you something. He's more than a good example. He's more than a kind person. He's more than a loving example. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that had to suffer and die for our sins and take away our sins. Jesus Christ, listen, to save us from the wrath of God. There is such a thing as the wrath of God. And you've never seen anything. You can't imagine anything till you perceive by the Holy Ghost what the wrath of God is against sin. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus said, I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I want to tell you, He suffered and died to save my, save Reggie Kelly from his sins. To save Reggie Kelly from hell. And I'm saying this, that He came to save you and I from the penalty of our sins to keep us simply, and in basic terms, from dying and going to hell, being separated from God forever. In Revelation chapter 20, that in verse number 10, the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them. The devil that deceived them. Are you reading it? Say amen. amen. The devil that deceived them. Are you listening to me, lost man? The devil that deceived them. Deception is the primary tool of the devil. And there is a real devil. And that real devil is, listen, he's not going to heaven. He's doomed and damned and sentenced already. And the worst thing that Satan can do against God is to take you, God's creatures, to hell with him. And he's not playing monkey business about it. He'll meet you every Sunday morning here from now till the trumpet sounds to keep you from getting saved. He's serious about taking you to hell. He has no hope. He is full of bitterness. He is full of hatred toward God. And the worst thing he can ever do against God is to take you, God's created person, to hell with him. Now I'm saying to you today, the Bible says the devil that deceived him. Are you deceived this morning? If you're not saved by the grace of God, I say to you, you are at this very moment in deception. Brother, that's how you'd get saved. He said the devil that deceived him was cast into where? The lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now you listen to me. This is what the devil and all of his religious crowd and philosophers and educators do not want you to hear. There is a place called the lake of fire. And those who are thrown into it and cast into it dwell there forever and forever. Look at verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place for them. Found no place for them. And I saw the dead. That's talking about those people who are dead, who are dead, spiritually dead. This judgment here is the great white throne judgment. It is the judgment of the dead lost. It is the judgment those people refuse Jesus Christ. The judgment of Christians is back in the epistles. The judgment seat of Christ. This is a judgment exclusively for the lost people who lost without God. Verse number 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So now you learn that hell is a separate place from the lake of fire. That this place called the lake of fire is totally separate and subsequent to the place that we know called hell. 
And the Bible said, The sea gave up the dead which were in death, and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged of men according to their works. Watch verse number 14. And death and hell were cast where? Into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse number 15. Let's read it together. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's say it. Let's read it again one more time together. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I will say something to you, to friend, today. If you're here and you're lost, your name is not in that book. Right now, your name's not in that book. You are lost. You're not going to be lost. You're lost now. And you've only got seconds. You've only, you don't know you've got another 30 minutes in this world to live. There could be a blood clot flowing through your veins. Listen, this week I know a, a man went to St. John's Hospital with a blood deal in the back of his brain. Began to have serious headaches. My wife's grandmother was holding her uncle as a small child driving down the road. And just leaned over against the window and died because of aneurysm in her head. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. You're lost now. You're not going to be lost. You're lost now. Your name is not in that book. And if your name's not in that book, you're headed to the lake of fire. I'm saying this in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said, These shall go away into everlasting punishment. Not temporary. Not like the seventh day I've been to say that you just burn up like a cigarette and that's it. No. Jesus said everlasting punishment. These words forever and forever are the most horrible, terror-filled words I know of in the Bible. They're, they're more terror-filled than the word hell itself. Because you see, if hell the lake of fire was just temporary, then somehow or another it would seem that we might be able to endure it. But when you lift that thing and understand that he says they're cast there forever and forever, that there's never any escape from this place, that absolutely makes my spine tingle. It makes my soul fear rise up to me. Oh, that we serve a holy, righteous God who will in no wise through the guilty. A God who is so righteous that He requires perfect righteousness, but has provided that perfect righteousness in His Son, Jesus Christ. And He imputes that righteousness by gift of, and through faith to you. And yet, if that's rejected, He cannot be a holy God without casting those away from Him. And let me tell you something. We don't know what we're talking about, the wrath of God. We don't understand. We don't conceive what it is to know about the wrath of God. In Isaiah 5, 14, the Bible said, Therefore hell hath enlarged her mouth to hold the multitudes that are going in it. I'm telling you, the Bible said that hell is enlarging its mouth because there's so many people going into hell. Did not Jesus say, Straight as the gate and the way, and few there be that find it? Did He not say, Wide as the gate and broad as the road that leads to destruction? And many therein which go, are there which go in thereat. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 9, He said, Hell from beneath thee is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. In Isaiah 33 verse 14, the Bible said, Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burning? You know what? Every time I get up to preach, I sometimes think about that verse. Who is it among us here today that's going to die and go to hell? Forever and forever. You will take something. Some of you this morning look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm weird. You know what that is? That is simply confirmation of Scripture. Because the Bible said, through the foolishness of preaching, that men will be saved. Through the foolishness of preaching, men will be saved. You know what the difference between teaching and preaching is? Teaching gives you information in your brain. And you can teach the people a lot about the Bible. But preaching you know, of the Word of God brings you under the authority of the Word of God and you've got to do something with it this morning. I promise you this morning you're going to either walk out of here submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you're going to walk out of here this morning as a rebel and, and, and in trouble with God on your way to hell. You mark it down in your day book. You're not going to walk out of here just like you walked in. You're going to walk out of here one way or the other this morning either having received Christ or rejected Jesus Christ. You're going to do something with Him, friend. You're going to do something with Jesus Christ. You can't get by without Him. And by the way, just in case you're interested, you said, I'm not going to bow before Jesus. I'm not going to kneel some altar and ask Jesus to save my wretched, hell-deserving, lying-stealing, adulterating, fornicating soul. Oh, yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. The Bible said that there's going to be a day in which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Father. I will tell you something. If you're a rebel in here this morning, you, you choke on that to rest this message. You just choke on that. Because someday... 
You're going to kneel. I promise you're going to get on your left knee, right knee, and you're going to say, Jesus, you are Lord. The question is, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Do it while now you can be saved or do it then when it's too late. I'm telling you this morning, listen, there's, there's more phony baloney religious garbage going on in this country than make a mule puke. Make a mule puke. People are dying and going to hell and we're talking about all kinds of religious garbage. I'm telling you this, listen, if there's anything, you can put all the horrible descriptions you can know for God's Word and then you put about hell and you put the word forever at the end of that. Brother, I'm going to tell you something that will scare the daylights out of you. You listen to me this morning. Who is it among us this morning that's going to die and go to hell in this church house? Who is it that you've walked through those doors 150, 200 times, and yet you're a play game with God, and yet you're not really saved? How many times are you going to come and go out that door and reject Jesus Christ? Who is it sitting here this morning who will wind up screaming and burning in hell forever because they would not be saved today? If there's anything that reveals the righteousness of God Almighty, it is that He rightly punishes sin. It is that He forever puts sin away. It is that He's made provision for us to escape it and that He warns us about hell. I don't want a God who does not punish sin and punish the sinner. Are you listening to me? I, don't, I, I wouldn't believe in a God who didn't punish sin. If I read this Bible and God didn't punish sin, if God wasn't holy, I wouldn't worship Him. For Him to be holy, for Him to be just, He must punish sin. You wouldn't like a judge that would not punish a rapist. You wouldn't like a judge that wouldn't punish a murderer. And yet human justice is slop compared to the righteous judgment of Almighty God. I promise you, every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed must be paid for. God is just and God is holy. He said to flee from the wrath to come. Heaven is eternal, right? Brother, hell's eternal. But did you know the lot of the crowd that thinks heaven's eternal does not believe hell is or is eternal if it is? Did you know that in the New King James Bible that they got the New King James Bible? That 23 times they've taken the word hell out of it. You know what that tells me? They don't believe it. Did you know in the NIV and all the other perversions, uh, substitutes of Scripture we've got, that they've replaced the word hell with the word grave? You know something? That would be comforting to me if I was a lost sinner. Just to think, well, that's just, I just die like a dog and they'll go back to the dirt like a dog that there's no life after death. Those Bibles are lies. They're forgery out of the bowels of hell. You mark it down your day, Brooke. I'm saying this to you. Say, Red, you mad this morning? You better believe I'm mad. I'm mad at the devil and his deception. I'm mad because he's got people fooled. He's got people thinking they can get saved in their own sweet, stupid time. I'm sick of the deception. I'm tired of the devil leading people to hell. My whole life, my whole purpose for existence is to keep people out of hell by preaching the Word of God. If it doesn't mean something to me, I ought to, I ought to quit and go outside and shoot pool to pool hall. If this thing's not real, let's get out of here. If it's not right, let's forget it. Hey, man, this Bible's a lie. Let's forget it and go home. But at least let's don't be a bunch of hypocrites and act like part of it's not true. If there's no hell, and if God doesn't send sinners there, God is not holy. He's not just if He doesn't send sinners to hell. If there's no hell, and God, if God doesn't send lost people there, Jesus Christ is an imposter and a liar. If there's no hell, and if God doesn't send sinners there, the Bible's full of lies. If there's no hell, and, the, and God doesn't send sin, lost sinners there, there's no explanation for death, nor life, nor existence, and there's no need for salvation. But there is a hell. There is a place of conscious, eternal torment. And I'm preaching today on the hell of hell. That is that it's eternal. That is that it's forever. That is that if you die... And the second you die, it's over with forever and forever with you. Why and how? First of all, the eternity of hell is worse than its creation. Did you ever wonder why and how did God create hell? The Bible gives the answer in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Jesus said, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you listen to this preacher this morning. I want to give a teacher some doctrine on the doctrine of hell. Hell was not created for you. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 22, God said that hell was kindled in the wrath of God. And hell was created for Satan and his angels. But here's the thing. If you go to hell, you'll basically go as an intruder. It was not made for you. 
But man has sinned. Man has rebelled against the God and man, against God, and man has followed the devil. Now you listen to me. You tell me how you can follow the devil all through your life and not follow him into hell. Isn't it strange that people think they can follow the devil all through their life, but somehow they have the right to laugh, they're going to turn and go to heaven. Don't be deceived, dear friend. If you are unsaved in this building this morning, you are lost without God. You are following the devil, even if it's Sunday by Sunday. The devil is your master. The devil is your king. The devil is your ruler. When the Holy Ghost of God says, repent of your sins, and you walk out that door and reject Jesus Christ, you are obeying the will of your father, the devil. Jesus said to those religious people, you're of your father, the devil, and of the will of your father will you do. When you, the very fact, you listen to me, the very fact that you reject Jesus Christ ought to be the truthful testimony to your own conscience that you're under the power and dominion of a devil who is intent on deceiving you and taking you to hell. It's created for, you know what a Judas goat is in a packing plant? A Judas goat in a slaughterhouse is one in the old days for especially when they slaughtered all the sheep and the goats. A Judas goat worked on the docks of the packing house. And when the truck backed up there and those sheep coming from those ranches, strange to that place would stand like this up in the truck and wouldn't move out. And it was quite a job for a man to try to get eight sheep out. Oh, they come up with a slick trick. They got what's called the Judas goat. And the Judas goat would come up to the gate of that truck and go, bad. And what he was saying to those sheep was, follow me, it's okay. And the Judas goat would trot off down through the ramp, down through the alley, and all of a sudden those sheep, here they come. Oh, look who, he's going that way. He'll be all right. Let's follow him. And the Judas goat led him down into the slaughter pen, and then the man shut the gate, and the old Judas goat circled back up, come to the gate, he lets him back out to go for another patch, and those guys got their head cut off. I'm saying to you today that if you're following the devil, he's a Judas goat. He's leading you to hell. Listen to me this morning. This world's educational system is leading multitudes to hell by telling them that they came from a monkey. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't send my child to a school who calls God a liar and still claim to be a child of God. I don't think God thinks that's very funny. I don't think God is amused a bit about Christian people letting their children be led to hell by a liar called evolution. I don't think God's, I don't think God's a bit amused about us doing that. That's why I don't, I don't, I can care less what this community thinks about me. I'm concerned about my children and the families of this church going to heaven and not being led to hell. Amen. This government education system, this government news media, the false religions, the evolutionists are all Judas goats to lead you to hell. God said in Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God's not going up there, oh goody, I get to throw him in hell. God says, I have no pleasure. God says, I don't want you to go to hell. But he cannot accept but be a just God. He has to extend punishment. He has to destroy sin. First Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but His long-suffering to us word, not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. The highest attribute of God is not His love. The highest attribute of God is His holiness. You say, Reggie, prove that to me. Does God love everybody? Yes, He does. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But is everybody going to heaven just because God loves them? Listen to me. Is everybody going to heaven just because God loves them? No. Why not? Because God is holy and His holiness is above His love. And God's holiness must be satisfied. Why, you say, Reggie, God will not forfeit His holiness just because He loves you. But because He loves you, He's waiting to make for His holiness to be satisfied through the sacrifice and substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Oh, may the Holy Ghost knock your head with that this morning, that Jesus died in your place on the cross. The hell of hell is worse than its creation, but secondly, the eternity of hell is worse than its reality. May I ask you this morning, do you really believe in hell? Do you really believe there's a place called hell in the lake and also a place called the lake of fire? If you don't, I want to tell you, you're headed there. You're just the person God has explicitly said is going. For in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, He said, But the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
The unbelieving. The unbelieving. If you don't believe that there's a hell, the people who do not believe in hell are explicitly condemned in the Bible as those who are particularly going there. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 will nullify every false concept and every false doctrine about hell. For it says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. What are they going to do with the lake of fire? What are, what are the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses going to do with the lake of fire? Luke chapter 16 verse 23 said, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Jesus Christ said that. You want to call Jesus Christ a liar? Stand up and do it this morning. Stand up and say, I, I think he's a liar. If you can't do that now, my God, what will you do in the day of judgment? From 50 to 98 percent of American church-going people do not believe in a literal eternal hell and place of conscious torment. Just what the devil wants. Jesus spoke much more about hell than he did heaven. The Jehovah Witnesses will come to your house and say, A loving God and Father would not cast his children into a fire. Would you send your kids into a fire? And you say, no. And they say, well, neither does our father send his children to hell. The problem with that little misleading devil trap is that until you're born again the Spirit of God, you're not God's child. God doesn't send his children to heaven to hell. But if you're not his child, he will send you to hell. That is one of those cleverly trapped questions. That's why God said, you know what? God knows how stupid and ignorant most of us are. That's why I said, don't have them in your house, forbid them God's speed, because it's those that they took years to study up those trick questions to ask you, to cause doubt in your mind, because once they have intellectually asserted themselves over you intellectually, you said you're like a student to a teacher. Are you listening to this preacher this morning? They didn't just walk up there with their little phrase. They practice those phrases. They know those phrases. And they're depending on the average Christian's ignorance about things. Idolatry. Jehovah Witnesses are idolaters. Before they have conceived a God in their mind that is not the God of this Bible. They have conceived a God in their mind that does not punish sin nor doesn't, have, doesn't send sinners to hell. I tell you in love and in tears and reality this morning that hell is a reality. And I'm preaching this morning on that subject that you might repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus Christ. Why do you give a flip about who thinks about you next week if that's your job? You're going to die and go to hell because somebody thinks, well, he got saved. You got You're got going to let their teasing send you to burning hell forever? Wake up, man. The hell of hell is also worse than its location. Where is hell? Where is hell? Re- Re- Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 says it's called it a bottomless pit. Well, we think surely something's got to have a bottom to it. God says it's a bottomless pit. Isaiah 14 verse 9 said that hell is beneath our feet. Ezekiel 32, 27 says they went down to hell. Where is down? Hell is the bottom of the pit. Hell is beneath our feet. And hell is down. Where is down? Where is beneath your feet? It's where north, south, east, and west meet. Throw me that basketball there. If you can there. I want to use this basketball as a picture of the earth. God says that you and I are on the surface of this earth. God said that hell is down from wherever you're at. God said it's beneath your feet from wherever you're at. God said it's a bottomless pit. God says that it's in the heart of the earth. It is where north and south and east and west meet. Hell is in the heart of the earth. You see, hell is like the local county jail. It's where lost sinners are held until sentencing to the state pen. The state pen is like, the the lake of fire is like the state pen. It's the final place. The only difference between it is there's never no exit from the lake of fire. It's an eternal sentence. Not a life sentence. It's an eternal sentence. When a lost man dies, his body goes where? Into the grave. But his soul and his spirit go into hell. In Luke 16, and the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now you listen to this preacher. When you die, your body goes into the grave. It returns unto the dust. But you're not just a body. You are a spirit, soul, and body. And there is such a thing the Scripture teaches as a soulish body with senses. senses. Because the rich man in hell, though he was buried... But it also said that in hell he lifted up his eyes and being in torment he could feel and sense everything that he could sense like you can sense now. He had memory. 
He said, send Lazarus. That he, made, to, to, he said, send Lazarus. And they dipped the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He had a soulish body. For I'm tormented in these flames. He could remember. He could feel. He could perceive. He knew distance. He could see Father Abraham across the gulf. That's the reality of what the Bible teaches about hell. Five times in that passage of Scripture, it says it's a place of torment. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. Jesus said, As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You think about this for just a minute. I want to draw the earth to you here. Jesus said that He would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it teaches us that when Jesus died and rose in the grave, that He descended into the heart of the earth and led captivity captive. Let me show you what went on. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was a thief on each side. The thief that believed on Jesus that day and placed his trust and faith in Him, Jesus said to that man that this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He did not say heaven. Paradise, according to Jesus in Luke chapter 16, was in the heart of the earth. For the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and seen Abraham, seen Lazarus in Abraham's bosom afar off. This was called Abraham's bosom or called paradise. Now you listen to me good. When a person died before Jesus Christ came and suffered and died and then took His blood to the Holy of Holies, the true tabernacle in heaven, they could not enter into the presence of God. Man cannot, could not, never will be able to enter into the presence of God as a lost, as a sinner without blood, sinless blood atonement on the mercy seat. We're getting ready to go into the book of Exodus in the tabernacle. You better be here. You want to know true doctrine. You get here. That blood for the sins to be atoned and paid for had to be placed on the mercy seat. Those people who died before Jesus Christ placed His blood on the mercy seat could not go into the presence of God. And you never read one time in the Word of God that they did. You never read one time they went to heaven. Where'd they go? They went to paradise. That's why Jesus told the thief on the cross, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Then it says, the Bible teaches, when He rose from the dead, that He ascended and led captivity captive. Did you know what He done? He went to heaven. He placed His own blood on the mercy seat of the true tabernacles in heaven, satisfied the just demands of the Holy God for all eternity. Amen. Sins was paid for. Amen. And those who had placed their faith in that prior to His coming and died, He went and got their souls and their spirits, took them back to heaven into the very presence of Almighty God. And I don't care if you don't believe that or not. You just don't believe that. That's what the Bible teaches. Clear and simple. Just as sure as you're sitting in your seat this morning. Let me tell you something. God does not contradict Himself nor His pattern of salvation. But when the rich man died, that was before all that. He could see Abraham to a great gulf. And he could converse with him. You say, I don't believe that. I don't care. That's your problem. You'll believe the Bible. Believe! 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 Start believing God instead of believing your own mind and the devil's lies and the world's trash. Start believing that book. This old thing, friend, going to hold you up when you're dead. All that garbage that stuff's going to be gone. Amen. You better believe this book. You going to tell you something. That's why the devil attacks this book night and day without stop. Jesus emptied out the heart of the earth, paradise. Now they're in the very presence of God. And now all that's left in hell, all that's left in the heart of the earth is hell. Now you say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I'm saying that when men die now, their bodies go in the grave, their spirit and soul goes into hell. All that's left in the heart of the earth now is hell in the bottomless pit. You say, Reggie, how's that? In this earth, there's molten liquid lava. The earth's crust is about 6 to 12 miles thick on the average. Beneath this crust is molten hot liquid lava. It ranges from 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit to 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the center. I didn't say 90 degrees. I didn't say 900 degrees. I didn't say 2,000 degrees. 9,000 degrees out toward the surface to 30,000 degrees in the center. This earth 
is approximately 25,000 miles in circumference. If you go around it, it's on an axis. It's 4,000 miles through the diameter. Now, stay with me. This earth is spinning on its axis. There's a force that scientists have never understood. They work with it, but they can't explain it to you. It's called gravity. It works just like this right here. You tilt that thing up, it don't float in the sky. It goes down. If you and I were to cut a hole in this floor of this church house this morning... And take a big auger bit, drill a hole through this earth, the floor of this thing, and bore through the crust of this earth, that gravitational force goes to the core of this earth. Now you think with me. Jesus said hell is a bottomless pit. This thing is 25,000 miles in circumference, 4,000 mile diameter. It's spinning at approximately, it's spin, it turns on axis every, it's about 25,000 miles, around about a thousand miles, a little over a thousand miles an hour it spins because it turns a full deal every 24 hours. The average gravitational pull of a man is a 165-mile-an-hour gravitational pull. If you drop that man through a hole in the floor crust of this earth, in 12 hours' time, he will have traveled, I believe it's 1,980 miles. You multiply 12 times 165, see what you come up with. I believe it's 1,980 miles. Average gravitational pull. He falls, let's see, he goes, gravitational pull. And in 12 hours' time, at 165 miles an hour times 12 hours, he has traveled 1,980 miles. Did you know that's within 20 miles of the center of this earth? But there's a problem. While he's been falling, this earth is rotating. And it is exactly what the Creator of it said it is. It is a bottomless pit. Because the gravitational forces and the rotation of it you never hit bottom. And let me tell you, in all honesty this morning, what no, what no teacher at some college will tell you, but in the center of the earth and what you set this morning, underneath your feet is like a wad of screaming, weeping maggots in the center of this earth who are never touching bottom. And they are weeping. And they are screaming. And they are gnashing their teeth right while we're singing Amazing Grace in our churches. And it is not a joke. You let me tell you something this morning. If I don't believe that, I promise you. If that's not, that book's not true, I'm out of here. I'm done. But it is true. You know for a fact, volcanoes erupt, what comes out? Lava. I've got a tape recording. Don't know whether it's true or not. Recorded in, from Russia. Supposedly where they drilled through the crust of the earth. And men grabbed their heads and say they nearly went insane to the noises that they heard. I don't know whether the, I've got the recording. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I'm going to tell you something. I know this Bible's true. It is scientifically accurate. It is a bottomless pit, just like Jesus called it. You say, Reggie, what else about the eternity of hell? The hell of hell or the eternity of hell is worse than its condition. You say, Reggie, what is the condition of hell? First of all, I want to say simply to you this morning that hell is, fire is the condition of hell. Fire! Fire is a condition of hell. Torment, pain, unending, eternal pain and fire and torment is a condition of hell. It's no wonder nobody wants to hear about hell. I don't enjoy preaching on hell. I said over in my speech this morning, God, should I preach something else? God, should I preach something else? But all week long, God has said to me, preach on hell this Sunday. Preach on hell. There's brimstone, there's wailing, there's weeping, there's gnashing of teeth. Jesus taught His disciples from the Mount of Olives. From the Mount of Olives, you can look down south of Jerusalem and see the Valley of Gehenna. That's where the pagan peoples offered their children to the god, brass god Moloch. He was a brass god with arms like this right here. They would build a hot fire and, it, and, and, and get that brass god red hot. And then at certain times of the year, they would take their children just like Americans are doing. They would take their babies and they would sacrifice their babies to this red-hot god Moloch. And they would come around there and those old pagan priests would dance and do all their rituals and do their singing and all the stuff. And this mother had this little baby and she handed it into the arms of that, that old pagan priest. And that pagan priest would go before that brass god Moloch and then he would cast that baby up into its arms while the heat and the fire blowed up. And those arms were made to catch those children. And those babies would weep! 
And those mothers would weep. And they would wail. And those babies' bodies would literally do blood in the flesh and the bones would drip through. And then they did something. They would take dogs as part of their ceremony. They would take dogs and then they would throw the dogs in on top of that fire at the base of this god Moloch. And the dogs hitting the fire and being burned, but at the same time smelling the blood and flesh of those babies, they would begin to gnash and bark. And that's where the gnashing of teeth, when Jesus taught His disciples who were to go out into the world and preach the gospel of Christ, when He taught them, He taught them from the basis of what they knew about the valley of Gehenna. Amen. Don't you ever believe it? Those Israelite people knew exactly what had went on down at that place. When they came into that land, God said, destroy those people. Utterly do away with them. They knew what He's talking about. And that's what He said. Jesus said, Hell, if you want a picture of hell, look down to what they were doing in Gehenna. Satan had total control of that place. He had total control of those people. And what they done brought them to weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and loss of their families. Do you think hell's a joke this morning? Do you think it's something you can twiddle with in your mind? Well, I might get saved. I might not. I don't know. One of these days, maybe I will. That is all. Line, hook, and sinker from the bowels of hell. Satan is reaching his grim reaper hand out your soul and trying to keep you from being saved. He knows. He knows. Let me tell you something. The devil knows this book is true. He knows it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And he's trying to keep you from being saved. It's worse. It's a place of thirst. You'll never walk up to a fountain or a spring. You'll never walk up with a glass to a sink and get you a glass of water. You'll never put 50 cents in a pot machine and get a cold Pepsi and get in your life. You'll never know what it is to feel a breeze coming across the field. You'll never look up and see the clear blue sky again, only sulfur and blackness and heat and the screams of the damned around you. You'll have the memory. As I said when I began this message, you will have the memory of the times and the opportunities that you could have been saved. And may I say to you, I believe the greatest hardest spot in hell is may not be for the Sodomites, but it's for those people who heard and heard and heard and rejected Jesus Christ. My God, have mercy on your soul. Then knowing that, but it's worse than that. Take your Bible. I want to show you a scene out of hell in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. I don't know when God will take me home. been some days this year I about wished He would have. I know one thing, I'm getting more happier about a glorified body than I've ever been. <laughs> Buddy, I'm going to tell you something. This thing of Christianity is sweet and real. Amen. And I tell you, I hate my flesh nature so bad, I'll be glad to shake that stupid thing loose. In this robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize. Revelation chapter 9. God gives this account during the tribulation period. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the what? The bottomless pit. Hell. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there, you talk about fifth smoke, buddy. If it darkens the sun, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them were given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. It's no wonder the modernists say that Revelation has no application. If I didn't read the Bible, I wouldn't want Revelation in here. No wonder they, they don't want people reading the book of Revelation. Lest it bring the fear of God on them to get saved. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared in the battle, and on their heads were gold crowns like gold. Their faces were the faces of men. They had what's this? And they had hair as the hair of a woman. That's why when I see a man with hair on him like a woman, I get thinking about Revelation in the bottom of the pit. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates that were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots and many horses ran to battle. What's this? And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottom of the pit, whose name is in the Hebrew tongue Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue had his name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, there come two woes more hereafter. 
And the sixth angel sound, I heard a voice, and I want you to jump down to verse 17 to save some time to show you these beasts. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. And then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, jacinth and brimstone, heads of the horses, whereas the heads of lions, and out of their mouths they issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like serpents and had heads. And with them they were hurt. Let me tell you something, friend, what you've got to look forward to and you bust hell wide open. There are beasts down in hell right now. They are waiting the great tribulation period that the, the angel is going to unloose them for a season. But they're down there now. Right now. You die today, you die next week lost. Buddy, you've got this to look forward to. There are beasts down there that have tails with serpent heads on the end of them. And they reach out and they bite and sting like a scorpion. They have teeth like a lion. Anybody want to go to a place like that? My God Almighty, my soul, my God in heaven, you ought to repent and get saved today. Amen. This thing is serious. You play in church? Jesus, is your little slot machine in your spare car on the back side of your soul that you, you want when you get in trouble? You're not saved. Who are you kidding? He will never be your spare tire. He will never be your spare tire. What you need is an old time deep returning of your soul to God Almighty. Us Americans are so cocky and so jawed up and so slicked up and perfumed up and pretty up. We think we're something. Let me tell you what we are. We're filthy, rotten, nasty, vile sinners to the core. Apart from the grace of God, we don't have any hope. Mark chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus probably gave one of the greatest discourses on the terribleness of hell there ever was. Jesus said that it's better for man, he said, to lose an eye. He said, it's better to have your eye taken out than to go to hell having two good eyes. He said, if your eye is offending you, in other words, your eye is, is, is what you like to watch and what you like to see is keeping you from being saved. Jesus said, you'd be better off to gouge out your eyes. And die and go to hell, die and go to heaven having one eye, then die and go to hell having two eyes. Now that's serious. And if he had just said that, that'd have been enough. But he went further and said, if thy hand offends thee, if your hand's keeping you from getting saved, you like to do things, and you like to participate in things, that's keeping you from being saved. Jesus said, you'd be better off to take your hand and have it sawed off. Can you imagine somebody coming into church this morning with an eye out and a hand off? You'd say, that poor guy. Now, I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, if he's saved and you're lost, he's way better off. You are. Amen. Jesus said, further, if your foot's offending you, in other words, if your foot's causing taking you places, and you will not give up that which your foot, hand, and eye wants to do, he said, you'd be better off cutting your foot off and die maimed and go to heaven than having two good feet, two good hands, and two good eyes and go to hell. Now, you tell me what else he's got to tell you. What else has he got to tell you? I want to tell you something this morning. If you're saved by the grace of God in here and your sins are forgiven, you're washed with blood, you ought to be the happiest soul in three counties. I'm telling you this morning something, folks. We forget what it is when God saved us. We forget what it was when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The only way in the world we could ever be saved. I'm telling you the condition of hell is worse. The, the eternalness of hell is worse than its condition. The hell of hell, the eternity of hell is worse than its darkness. Mark 8, 12 says that they were cast into outer darkness. Not utter darkness, but outer darkness. Luke chapter 13, verse 28. The Bible said, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. You know what he said there? There's an outer darkness. In a building, especially at night, if you're out in the darkness, there's a window. You can see in, but the people inside can't see out. That's outer darkness. And what God, if you listen to me, check Isaiah 66 if you don't believe this. Those in hell, in some capacity, will be able to see where they could have been. Outer darkness. What would it be to die and go to hell? You say, Reggie, you've described a lot of things about hell this morning, but what is the worst thing about hell? The worst thing about hell is that it's forever. You know why my heart hurts for some of you young people? Because I see myself in you when I was a young person. 
One foot in the church. The other foot in the world. One foot don't want to go to hell. But one foot wants to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And I agree for you. Because I see myself. If hell was just for five minutes. Maybe somehow or another we could still it! Yeah! For five minutes. But hell's not for five minutes. You ever thought what it would be like to die and go to hell? You're on that road. The radio's playing. And the last thing in your mind is that in 15 seconds you're going to be in hell. You come around that curve and poof. You ever thought what it would be to die and go to hell? When you take the, I've been to hospitals so many times and seen people take their last breath. I've seen them struggling. I thought to myself, what were their first sense of perception? Was it a sense of smoke? Was it the smell of sulfur and brimstone? Did all of a sudden they begin to hear something like, ah! But let me tell you what would be worse than anything you've ever seen or thought about hell. And that is to wind up in there and realize, oh God! Oh God, I'm here forever! When that hits your soul, You've never known torment. And this hell was for five years. Steve, if it was for five years, I think somehow or another, Steve, maybe I could just curl up in a ball and just think. But the hope of knowing that at least five years from now, five years from now, my constant unending thought would be five years from now, I'd get out. If hell was for 500 years, do you know what your constant thought would be? At least 500 years from now, man. And may I say, even if you thought hell was only for 5,000 years, may I go further and say, if you thought hell was only for 5 million years, there would be out there on the horizon of your mind that little star. Someday, I get out of here. The hell of hell is that it's forever. And you never. There are no exit doors in hell. There are no water fountains in hell. There are no doors out of hell. There are no prisoners escape. You cannot suicide out of it. There are no drugs or liquor to get your mind off of it, to take away the reality of it. Liquid waves of fire splash against the walls of hell and seem to stay forever, forever. Beasts with bat-like wings come float and sting you and gnash upon you. And they say and hiss at you forever. You're here forever. Satan himself will look upon you and laugh. And let me tell you something. He will reach and pull the mask off of his face and laugh in your face. I led you to hell. Who among us this morning shall dwell with everlasting burning? Our Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. Jesus, I thank you that you suffered for my sin and that you rose from the dead. And that you conquered death, hell, and the grave, and it has no more power over me because of what you did at Calvary. Oh, God, today, oh, my Lord, save the lost that are here, I pray. Lord, we can only go so far. We can lift our voice like a trumpet and preach the eternal truths of the Word of God, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, 
must convict of sin and draw to the Savior. I pray that you'll save the day in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I want you to sing just as I am in just a moment. You listen to me good now. Listen. The God of this Bible, the God of creation, the God of redemption, gave His only begotten Son. And He gave Him to pay the full price for your sins and for mine. Folks, I'm going to tell you, He gave it all. He gave heaven's finest, heaven's best, and the only thing that could redeem you. And God made it so that it's a gift to you today. Eternal life is a gift to you. And when you listen to me, you listen to me good. If you come today as a guilty, repentant sinner to God, God, and you receive Christ as your Savior today, you call upon the Lord to save you in Jesus' name, God will give you eternal life. Are you listening to me? We're not talking about some do-better club. We're talking about salvation. We're not talking about some help, self-help effort system. We're talking about a God that will save you 100% totally forever. A God who will redeem you. A God who will save you. A God who will make you His child. A God who will put you into the body of Christ. And for God to ever lose, you have to cut off part of the body of Christ. I'm talking to you today, listen, from the Bible. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Are you listening? I'm not offering you some kind of religious system. I'm offering you the salvation of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All that come to me, he said, I will in no wise cast out. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God will fully and freely save you today on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you on that old rugged cross. Why will you die and go to hell? I want to say this to you. When you reject Jesus Christ, you are virtually spitting in the face of Almighty God. And you are trampling the precious blood of His Son under your feet. And if you don't get saved today, friend, and you walk out that door, when you cross that threshold, you remember you are trampling on the blood of Jesus Christ. And God will not be amused. And there's nothing else that He can do for you He's already did it all when He gave His Son for your sins, for your lying, for your stealing, for your hatred, for your adultery, for your fornication. God's Son paid it all. And He'll forgive you of every sin that you've ever done. And I pray this morning that you will come. In just a few moments, we're going to ask you to stand. And I want you to step out as fast as you stand. I don't want you to stop one second and let the devil lie to you another moment. And you may say, Reggie, I went forward in a meeting one time. And I, listen, I don't know nothing about your religious background. I'm just going to say this to you today, that if the Holy Ghost of God is talking to you today, and you're not at peace with God, I don't care what your name is, don't care where you are, who you are, I'd hit this altar and I'd say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and I'm going to believe you for my salvation and for my deliverance from your wrath in hell. And I place my faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. And God, you'd have to be a liar not to save me. Lord, save me today in Jesus' name. Hello, friend. Thank you for listening to this message from God's Word, the Bible. And this is Pastor Kelly, and I want to thank you for again for listening to this message. And I want to talk to you about the most serious issues that you and I will ever face, and that is our relationship to God. About salvation, about being saved, about being born again, forgiven, reconciled to God. You see, you have a problem, and I had a problem, and that problem is sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law, and you and I have sinned. We've broken. In fact, the Bible teaches in James chapter 2, if you broke one, you broke them all. 
I don't think many of you that are listening would argue with me that we're sinners. Sinners by nature and sinners by birth. And we're guilty before God. Now you and I are in big trouble because we're in trouble with God. It's one thing to have the law of man and the law of society after you. But it's another thing to have the law of God after you, to be in trouble with God. So we have a problem. That problem is sin. You and I have committed more sins than we can remember. We can't even call them all to remembrance today. There are so many. But I'm glad to tell you, secondly, there's a penalty for sin. And I'm glad of that because I'm glad God's a holy and a just God. The penalty for sin was death. He told Adam and Eve, in the day of the chief thereof, you shall surely die. And they did. They died spiritually. They were separated from God. The word death means separation. And they died a physical death later on. That's why death and destruction and misery and sin of all kinds is around you and I because of sin. But the main penalty for sin is eternal death. That is separation from God in the lake of fire forever and forever, tormented in that fire. That's the penalty for our sin. So we have a problem. We have a penalty. But the greatest and best news you've ever heard is that we have a provision. Jesus Christ, the righteous. God, God knows that we're sinners. And God knows we can't save ourselves. And God knows the condition that you're in out there today. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Think about that phrase. He suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Why did he suffer? To bring us to God. The provision is that Jesus Christ paid for your sin by his death, burial, and resurrection. Isaiah 53 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Philippian jailer wanted to be saved and asked the Apostle Paul, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What did he mean, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Believe that he is the Son of God, and that he died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, and that includes you, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, All that come to me I will in no wise cast out. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. There was a man one day, the Bible records, who went to a church and he prayed this prayer, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to ask you right now to do it. I want you to do it right now. I want you to do it not tomorrow, not the next day. I want you today to cry out to God. If you know that you're a sinner, you agree with God that you're a sinner, and you're under conviction about that sin, Listen, I'm not talking about a fix for all the problems you have. I'm talking about a fix for the situation between you and God. You're living in a world of sin, and you're going to have to deal with that till you die. I'm telling you. But I'll tell you something. It's good to know after you die that you've got a place where there's no more tears and no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin, no more devil, not even your own flesh nature to have to deal with. And if you'll call on the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God wants to save you, He's able to save you, and He's made provision to save you. I hope you'll do that today. It's by faith, friend. It's not by anything else but faith. you just got to believe God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It is a gift, and I hope you'll do that. We just want you to know that God really does love you. Christ really did die for you, and He's risen from the dead, and He's able to save you to the uttermost. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by Him. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening again to this tape and so long.